<laughs> I'm very glad to be with this group again, or with many of you again, uh, having spoken about the Encyclopedia of Puritanism a couple of months ago. Um, this is a new project. And while the editors uh, are listed on this slide in alphabetical order, I, I want to point out that uh, this idea actually was Greg Salazar's. Uh, he approached me and then we approached Anne and tried to put this all together. Um, this is going to be a fairly large book. Uh, there are going to be six sections, 31 different essays. And what I'm going to do is to simply talk you through a little about this, give you an idea of what the essays are all about uh, so that you have a better idea of what you might want to ask questions about later. Uh, so we'll start with the first section, uh, slide please. The first section deals with the geographies and chronologies of Puritanism. Uh, we have five essays that are gonna deal with the roots of Puritanism going back before this group's particular interest and moving up into the 18th century. So beyond your area of particular interest. Uh, we have different people talking about the roots, the evolution of the Puritan movement, uh, the period of the mid 17th century, and then the aftermath, the restoration and into the 18th century. Next slide, please. We then have a section on theology and practice. And I think one of the things that probably does make this project uh, distinctive among various encyclopedias, companions, and so forth dealing with Puritanism uh, is that we do have a very strong focus on the religious aspects of this, both uh, the theology and also the practice. And we have people who are going to write about uh, the full spectrum of Puritan theology, what is considered Puritanism, the debates over ecclesiology or church order, uh, how the doctrines were spread through preaching, uh, through catechizing, et cetera. And then Greg himself is going to talk about how individuals put all of this uh, into practice. Okay, the next slide. The next section deals with politics, uh, the degree to which Puritanism influenced uh, political affairs, uh, both in England, in the godly Republic of Queen Elizabeth down through the period of the revolution, but also into the Atlantic world. Uh, we're going to have David Como writing about Puritanism and radical politics, the extremes of the movement. Uh, we'll talk about religious liberty and so forth. And granted, perhaps a little bit of an odd selection in terms of politics, uh, Dan Richter is gonna be talking about Puritans and native peoples. Uh, that'll be on, on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, next slide, please. We also want to look at Puritanism in terms of what its impact was on society and, and society, but also uh, the economy of the period. And so we'll be having authors write about uh, Puritan ideas about social equity, but also how Puritans put various ideas into practice. Uh, this will also include uh, a couple of essays dealing with women, both women's role in Puritanism generally, and of course, those women who were accused of witches uh, and how uh, that affected society, uh, both in England and in New England. Next slide. Um, culture, this is probably uh, an area where there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, in the last few decades, uh, increasingly uh, scholars from the field of literature looking at Puritanism, uh, but also uh, history of science and, and, and other areas. And so we're, we're going to have um, historians and others who are going to be writing about uh, Puritan poetry, imaginative writing, uh, art, music, and Puritan belief, uh, and so forth. Uh, next slide. Finally, uh, modern representations. Uh, the 
impressions that many people have of Puritanism when they talk about things being puritanical and so forth. And the ways in which representations of Puritanism have come down into our own times. Um, now, those are basically the six areas and the 31 essays that we have contracted. Um, I hope that this is going to be ready sometime next year for you. Uh, our deadline for the final version of essays is in October of 2023, and we hope that we will move uh, and that Oxford University Press will move very quickly uh, from that point. We have a fair number of the essays in. Uh, this was originally scheduled to be available uh, much sooner than it will be, but as we all understand, problems with COVID, disruptions to people's schedules because of illness, school closings and whatnot uh, delayed that. This is, um, I think one of the things I would also just like to say before passing on uh, to my colleagues for more detailed discussions of the content is that I think we, we were able to put together uh, and we did so consciously, uh, a combination of contributors, including both older scholars, well-established scholars is probably a, a nicer way to put it, uh, such as perhaps Anne and myself, such as uh, Greg. Uh, this still remains, particularly in England, a vital area of historical scholarship, a subject that brings many new people, providing many new insights. And I think you'll find that reflected in the essays when eventually uh, you are going to be able to read it. And so I think with that said, uh, and I'll be glad to answer questions later, uh, we should move on to Anne, who's going to talk particularly about some aspects of the definition of Puritanism. Right. Yeah, if you start with the second slide, Anne, that's probably because the other what the first that's that's us, you know, then okay. Okay, is that the one you want? Yeah, um, that, that's okay. lovely. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Well, it is great pleasure to address you. I perhaps have met some of you in Lyon quite recently, but it's um, very, it's good, you know, amazing and good that, that all these French students are interested in English Puritanism. Um, my responsibility in the volume is for the politics section, as you've seen, and the culture section. We've um, divided sort of initial responsibility for the essays. Um, between the three of us to have two sections each. But I've also somehow um, been tasked with doing the first draft of the introduction, which is no easy task, at least in the part that sets the agenda. And so I'm gonna talk today and, and some of it will be discussed in more detail by Greg. Pro definitions and boundaries and a little bit of the historiography. And I think what I would like um, you to think about is some in terms of a handbook or a companion um, to Puritanism some definitions um, work better than others actually and um, just a few the initial things on the slide as you will know Puritanism like other terms we're familiar with is a term of abuse that is then adopted as a badge of honour at least by the 1630s and 40s I think um, for by the people who are accused of being it invented people claim in the 1560s with the first criticisms of the Elizabethan settlement as but uh, you know creating a church too ceremonial too hierarchical and but half halfly reformed so it becomes a favorite term for this loose term we use the hotter sort of protestants by the late 1590s, the, the end towards Elizabeth's reign. 
And uh, I think Patrick Collinson said previously term schismatic, precisionist, Presbyterian um, were used rather than pure and became a catch-all term of abuse. So it's a term of abuse developed often in polemical context in relationships between people who dislike the sort of things they're arguing for. And Patrick Collinson's famous phrase, which I think in English Puritanism, in studies of English Puritanism, is now the dominant interpretation, um, is that it's not a thing identifiable in itself, but one half of a stressful relationship. It always emerges in a context in contradistinction to something else. And I think that, I think we would say, I would say anyway, that that's it within the English scholarship, the, the dominant position, though it's a complex one, as I'll say. And it's in contrast, I think, to people who in the 1960s and 70s, and I put Richard Greaves and a book I read when I was an undergraduate, JF News, Anglican Puritan, 40 years ago, people were looking for very fixed categories. So you could see anybody in early 17th century England decide whether they were a Puritan or an Anglican. Now, um, I'm in a hand, an Oxford um, history of Anglicanism, writing about Oliver Cromwell, edited by Anthony Milton, because he thinks you shouldn't use the term Anglican at all till probably the, 15, the 1660s. Because most, if you think Anglican describes the official English church, the argument would be that many Puritans were Anglicans because they agreed with uh, having a national church and that they didn't believe in anything that you couldn't find in people who were also conformist to that church. So we've moved away from the JF New type approach, I think, to seeing it as something that always has to be put in context. Peter Lake in Frank's um, 1993 volume, so Peter Lake also has a very good article, I think, in John Coffey and Paul Lim's Companion. He says it's a, he will insist that there are Puritans. He accused Collinson of inventing, you know, saying Puritans were only an invention, but that there it's a combination of a style of piety and divinity made up of lots of different strands that many non-Puritans, people wouldn't who wouldn't identify themselves as Puritan, um, would accept. And I've put Alex Rari down because I think that's another sort of almost extreme position um, where Alec Rari's very good book, um, I was on a committee that gave it a prize, Being Protestant in Reformation Britain, is actually basically, the, in a way, one opposite from Greaves and New, but also an opposite of Collinson. say was Puritanism. So I think he is almost collapsing together the established church with zealous, hotter sort of Protestantism. Same thing. But if I have the next slide um, very quickly, I think if I've got the right order. Yeah. So I think that the sort of forms of piety, and I won't say much about this because this is sort of what um, Greg's going to talk about. We could list characteristics of reliance on the scriptures a uh, belief in some form of predestinarian Calvinism, but influenced in the English, the old English context, particularly by Perkins, of being about the quest for assurance, the signs of salvation, being experiential or experimental, importance of preaching the word, and what um, Peter Lake in one of his enormous books that I don't know if you recommended, but is worth a browse through, if not a reading from cover to cover, an activist Christian piety, both in an individual sense of meditation, attending the scriptures, thinking of attending sermons, thinking about it, but also godly reformation of church and society. Um, and, I th and the combination and the zealousness of the activism of that would be what I think um, Lake would call Puritanism. For the next slide, and please. Now, what I want to stress about Collinson's stressful relationship 
is that that relationship was stressful in two directions. And again, um, Greg will say a bit more about the specific theological, religious aspects of that. Collinson, in most of his works, religion of Protestants, some of later articles, stressed really the relationship with conformist Protestants. And Peter Lake's work on moderate Puritans, I think, would fit there as well. So the, the most important relationship would be the relationship between Puritans and people who were more thoroughgoing or, you know, less problematic conformists within the English National Church. Um, Puritans, most Puritans, I would say, till the 1640s, believed that in England, believed that the Church of England was a true church. It was the visible church, the organ it was flawed. And it had, with the regime of Archbishop Lord, it had had all sorts of problems um, of innovations. But basically true doctrine could be preached within that church. And believing preaching was the ordinary means of salvation, there was a great, um, motivation to conform to that church and Puritans were not necessarily non-conformists but they also struggled with ceremonies with the powers of bishops um, and, and, and with um, you know a sort of co compromise of, tr of true radical of true Calvinist theology but what I think is very important and is associated particularly now with David Como and in a transatlantic context, Michael Winship, is that there is also a very stressful relationship of, if you like, the late moderate Puritans who tried to conform with more radical Puritanism, theologically um, associated in England and New England with antinomianism and the argument that the stress on assurance, the stress on activism is preaching a, a, a salvation of works, not of grace and spirit, and the notion that the church, the visible church, should be to some extent um, correspond with the visibly godly, and, and that the godly and the wicked mixed together raise problems. And I think current, the most exciting current work perhaps stresses that stressful relationship because it relates and Lake Como Winship particularly stress it stresses um, the tensions within Puritanism, um, the, te the tensions over salvation, the tensions over how you relate to the wicked, um, and the days of what in the national church was a thing indifferent, a thing you could put up with for to be obedient to authority and things that caused abuse, caused a real um, horror and prevented you um, dealing with um, true, you know, bit, bit true religion. The next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to think a bit a bit about the politics of it. Um, contemporaries, um, who thought became to agree that pure, you know, Puritan was just a member of the godly. I wanted to point to you from the political point of view that the great, um, the great manifesto against the evils of Charles the First um, personal rule in November 1641, although it was followed very quickly by um, the root and branch petition against the bishops, was overtly committed to reform of the national church, not to religious liberty or toleration. If I move to the next one quickly. And then I wanted to say at the end, Richard Baxter, one of the most famous self-consciously moderate Puritans, really demonstrates these two relationships First of all, he's saying Puritan is simply the godly, um, people who are strict and serious in a holy life. Many might be conformable to the church um, until the 1640s. On the other hand, the Richard Baxter, who'd been through the Civil War, 
thought that Puritanism had fragmented and that honest men who might have been amongst the godly had been seduced into what he regarded really as heretical positions. Um, antinomianism, Arminianism that he couples together, opposition to infant baptism, state democracy and church democracy. Because thinking about what I'm going to say today, it has occurred to me that it's quite hard to get from the Collinson position to the position in Mark, the section I'm involved in about Puritanism and revolution. And for that, we need to look at the tensions and contradictions within Puritanism. And finally, I just want to say something about boundaries. Um, Michael Winship has a very good book, Hot Protestants. And he says very definitely, um, Pur Puritanism um, began in the 1540s. So it began before the term emerged, which is worth thinking about. And it ended around 1690. Now, if only we could all be so certain, I think would be um, great. But I think um, we're thinking about legacies in, in our volume. I think there is a danger that we assume that Puritanism ends up in certain places um, and, and they may be very different in England and New England and there's a danger of anachronism but I think uh, adding to what um, Frank said about theology and religion in our volume I think what is not always easy but is very fruitful is trying to bring together not in agreement because I think they're very different the New English historiography and the English historiography, where the tensions lie and what we would think would be the legacies in each direction. Uh, yeah, I'll stop there. And, you know, there's lots of you, I hope, to lots of things to discuss. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anne. So I am going to share the third PowerPoint. Yeah, and just while while Anne is working on that, I just want to again uh, express my enthusiasm to be with you all and this opportunity to present on theology, practice, and modern legacies. The two sections in which I've been entrusted is uh, the se section on theology and practice, as well as the various modern representations and legacies of Puritanism. And I, I want to give a sense of the kinds of themes that we anticipate will show up and have shown up uh, in the various essays. Go to my uh, second slide, please. So uh, a major um, contribution that we're hoping will be of this volume is that um, we'll have a sense of the spectrum of Puritan theology. And this is particularly important given the trends in the recent literature that have stressed the internal disagreements among Puritans, Puritans or as they are known as the godly, um, that is critiquing uniform notions of Puritanism. One thinks of the work of Peter Lake and David Como, uh, who have shown that there was internal disagreement among Puritans, even over major doctrinal issues, and that thinking particularly about Como's work here, that antinomianism was a growing tendency among Puritans that reacted against the foundations of Puritan piety and Puritan practical divinity, something I'll be talking about um, in a little bit. Um, very interesting, too, that Como has connected the theological disagreements to some of the political um, disagreements as well, and that the roots of various civil war and post-civil war sectarian communities uh, arises from within Puritanism itself, though carefully concealed by what uh, Lake and Como have called the Puritan underground. Uh, one thinks about Lake's book, The Box Maker's Revenge, in which he really teases out the different mechanisms, as he calls them, that existed within Puritanism to help create a, a veneer of homogeneity, at least in print and in public. Um, things like censorship and uh, internal debates being handled in the Puritan underground. Um, as he says, establishment figures uh, controlled these di disputes by gloss glossing over uh, 
the issues at stake in which in ways that made continuing disagreement acceptable. And so, you know, uniform notions of Puritanism uh, come, come, you could say, as a, as a part of um, what the Puritans intended the public persona uh, to look like. And yet what we see in the 1640s is the failure of the self-regulating -regul mechanisms of the Puritan underground. Next slide, please. So we think about uh, theological diversity. Um, I think it's appropriate, and this is, is uh, a theme of recent literature, to think about theological diversity within the bounds of consensus as well. Uh, one thinks about the recent work, the edited volume by Michael Haken and Mark Jones entitled Drawn into Controversy, Reformed Diversity and Debates Within 17th Century uh, British Puritanism, in which they highlight that a common theme, you see this particularly at a place like the Westminster Assembly, um, probably the high point in which Puritan theology uh, is being crafted, um, that those confessional statements and catechisms were self-consciously being crafted in, in using formulas that could be described, as Richard Muller says, by all, including those who did not accept uh, whole cloth, every jot and tittle that, of another person's position. Um, there are various examples uh, that have been given if you want to get in really granular into the specific theological debates. And I've listed them there, things like um, uh, the debates about the atonement and the active obedience of Christ, uh, hypothetical universalism, that is, um, you know, Puritans were, were Calvinistic and believed that God predestined some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. And yet we see this idea of hypothetical universalism that, um, that God hypothetically uh, could, uh, could have predestined all, and yet he chose some. Uh, debates about the covenant, um, some were holding to two covenants, some to three, and then specific debates about Christology as well. Uh, interestingly, the work that's been done by Chad Van Dixhorn on Christology at the assembly, he's pointed out that the assembly itself had a certain anti-credal bent. That is, uh, there was a, a reaction against Laudianism and particularly what they saw as an over-reliance on church tradition. And for that reason, concerns about uh, adopting uh, creedal formulas like the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and some of these early uh, English, uh, excuse me, early church texts on, um, on Christology and Trinitarianism. Uh, next slide, please. We see diversity as well uh, in the realm of ecclesiology and uh, so ecclesiastical diversity within Puritanism. Uh, one thinks of Puritanism, of course, of being within the Church of England, and yet um, trying to not only reform the Church of England from within, but even set up an informal alternative system of church government. When we think about church order and ecclesiology, what we really mean is the nuts and bolts of how authority is ordered within, uh, within the established church. And the Puritans were heavily influenced from the beginning by some of the continental reformers, most famously John Calvin, and uh, what was taking place in Geneva, Switzerland. And they attempted to set up a classicist movement, that is, uh, a kind of Presbyterianism uh, that was uh, to exist alongside uh, the established church. Uh, a leader like Thomas Cartwright, who was a professor of theology at, at Cambridge University, and the eventual putting down of that movement and of English Presbyterianism by the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift, uh, at the end of the 1580s. Um, there's been debate about whether or not that, that content Presbyterianism continued to exist in England, post-1590, one thinks about the recent work of Polly Ha, not, uh, not an un, 
uh, a book that that has been con you, you know controversial in some ways um uh, the extent to which presbyterianism continued to exist she she's made the argument i think somewhat convincingly that it continued to exist underground so that when it reappears in the 1540s in the Westminster Assembly, um, it makes a lot of sense that it didn't just appear out of nowhere. Uh, what one thinks as well about uh, other um, ecclesiastical um, models like congregationalism uh, and English congregationalism, certainly congregationalism in Puritan New England, uh, there were there were congregationalists who were members of the Westminster Assembly as well, famously known as the Dissenting Brethren. Um, Hunter Powell's done excellent work on this. Uh, these this was a really a cohesive group that worked together. Uh, I've listed up there um, one of their co uh, co written volumes, uh, the Apologetical Narration. And these, these uh, divines worked hand in hand with Presbyterians, and yet uh, in the end, they dissented uh, a year into the assembly um, and, and really uh, functioned more or less independently, although they, they continued to try to work with, pure, with Presbyterians particularly following the Great Ejection in 1662. Uh, the major, you could say, nuts and bolts at the heart of the debate with, um, with uh, ecclesiology is this debate over the power of the keys and different ways to interpret Matthew 16, verse 19. Um, is, is authority in the church given uh, to the universal church? Is it, a, is it a power reserved to the apostles and then passed on through uh, a succession of bishops over the years? Or is it a power that's given uh, and delegated to pastors and elders? And uh, the, these are the things that really divide um, Presbyterians, Congregationalists. And then our final group, um, uh, Puritans who seem to have been open to a form of reduced episcopacy, at least uh, they were willing to tolerate it uh, for some time. Next slide, please. So um, also as a part of uh, when we think about Puritan theology is this emphasis on preaching and listening. Um, the work of uh, Arnold Hunt has shown that preaching was in the minds of the godly a dynamic exercise in religious controversy, uh, and that Puritans uh, were sensitive about uh, the reactions of their audiences to their sermons. Um, in terms of the Puritans' own conception about preaching, uh, we think about uh, William Perkins, who famously said that the preacher is God's mouthpiece, uh, properly the mouth of God to the people by preaching to them from God and then praying on behalf of the people uh, in the pastoral prayer. Um, they believed it was the first duty of the minister, uh, John Owen, uh, even going so far to say it's the principal duty of the pastor, is preaching. Uh, they emphasize what's been known as painful preaching. Um, that is a preaching that would wound the conscience uh, with the law and then bathe the wounds of the conscience with the healing balm of the gospel. Uh, they thought of themselves as physician of souls, um, those who um, would be involved in this exercise of spiritual soul surgery. Um, Puritans were also self-consciously um, uh, crafting their sermons um, in ways that uh, that were <clears throat> seen as uh, reacting against other styles that were within the Church of England. Um, they emphasized the importance of plain preaching, uh, that is a clear, open manifestation of the truth, the importance of uh, a logical, orderly, uh, even Romistic um, uh, approach to, to preaching. And then there's uh, emphasis on transitions from pulpit to print um, as Puritans were ejected from their pulpits, uh, finding new ways to have uh, 
influence through their preaching uh, has been a major theme of the literature. Uh, next slide, please. We have a chapter um, by uh, Chad Van Dixhorn and John Bowers on catechizing. Um, that is the practice of producing um, question and answer um, pedagogical, uh, pedag pedagogical tools to learn theology um, and pattern these uh, at times uh, according to what they call the best reformed churches. Uh, that is, uh, trying to find continuity between what was going on within Puritanism in England and what was taking place on the continent, most famously, of course, the Heidelberg Catechism. The most robust uh, catechetical project was that of the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechism uh, at the Westminster Assembly. Uh, recent work uh, done by Chad Van Dixhorn on the minutes and papers of the Westminster Assembly um, really gives uh, an a, a bird's eye view of what was taking place on the theological debates within the assembly. So when we think about, um, you know, Puritan diversity, part of the way that we can understand diversity within Puritanism is simply by the fact that we have some record, be it through the lens of the scribe for the assembly, uh, the, a record of the debates that took place. Um, the Westminster Assembly was a free synod to reform the Reformation itself, um, beginning in 1643. Uh, it was an attempt to undo the gains made by the Laudian movement in the 1630s, and an attempt to uh, reform church government, liturgy, and doctrine, which inevitably resulted in uh, these catechisms and confessions. Uh, they met over a period of 10 years in the middle of the English Civil War, um, 1300 uh, the Puritans were about producing these confessional and catechetical statements. Uh, these catech catechisms were put into practice. Uh, one thinks of someone like Richard Baxter, already mentioned previously, in the town of Kidderminster, and his attempt to go door family by family, home to home, and to catechize his entire church, which is famously laid out in a book like The Reformed Pastor, in many ways a a classic treatise on family visitation uh, from Puritanism. Next slide, please. And then, of course, um, this, uh, in some ways, all-consuming uh, chapter on the practice of piety, the ways in which all of this uh, was fleshed out in um, Puritan practical divinity, which became according to some, a major defining characteristic of Puritanism itself. That is, an attempt to apply doctrine uh, to all of life. That is, in the church and in the family, in society, what's called the Reformation of Manners. Um, and, uh, and, and this is, I think, an, an area that's very interesting because um, those who tend to be interested in uh, the practice of piety and Puritanism tend to fall in, at least this is my observation, one of two camps. You have on the one hand confessional or evangelical historians who mainly look at the theological convictions and practices of Puritanism, and they look at the devotional practices. On the other hand, um, you have other scholarly treatments that uh, focus rightly so on the impact of Puritan practical divinity and casuistry on things like despair um, and uh, the role that uh, it's played in legalism and in um, anxiety and depression and so many other of these famous themes that are that the Puritans have been known for. And yet it seems that at times that those uh, two camps, uh, there's not a lot of cross-pollination. That is, that uh, there would be tremendous benefit, uh, and I think a way forward in terms of next steps with the academic research, 
would be to bring these two things together and to see how they are uh, not mutually exclusive, but actually um, have a tremendous impact on one another. Um, <clears throat> let's just see here how much time we have. So you see there are some of the literature on that. Um, uh, Anne spoke previously about uh, experimental, uh, the experimental and experiential elements of uh, Puritanism. Um, some have said that Puritanism was a distinct style of Reformed theology and piety that the godly would have recognized in one another, uh, and then have added other things uh, as part of a definition of Puritanism. Uh, Warm-hearted piety uh, expressed through volunteer religion, as Patrick Collinson has famously talked about, or a discontentment with ceremonies and liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer, particularly Episcopal polity, um, and so I think this chapter on the practice of piety tries to bring together a lot of these uh, different themes in the literature, whether that's casuistry and assurance or theology and practice and its relationship um, uh, to so many other things. Uh, next slide, please. So just wrapping it up here, um, my focus primarily on the theology uh, and practice, but we do have a final section in the handbook that really looks at uh, Puritanism and modern representations, that is representations in literature and stage and film, uh, Puritanism and modernity, um, a chapter by Ethan Shagan, uh, as well as uh, Puritanism and national identity. Um, and then uh, I, what I think will be a very interesting chapter by John Coffey on Puritanism and modern evangelicalism. Um, of course, Puritanism has a long history um, of being studied by denominational historians, or what Peter Lake has called the intrinsic historians, who viewed themselves as continuing on in the living tradition of Puritanism. And yet, there seems to have been a, a real revival of interest in Puritanism, at least in America and in England, in, uh, in modern evangelicalism through the foundation of the Banner of True Trust in 1957 by a figure like Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was there in London uh, at the Westminster Chapel. Uh, this trust has focused uh, heavily on printing um, Puritan books, uh, some of which were hadn't been printed since the 19th century, and so reprinting them. And uh, we think about uh, a movement in America like New Calvinism, um, which finds its historical and theological roots within Puritanism, and many who are zealous uh, to put down the often repeated stereotype that Puritans were those who had a, quote, haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. And so um, uh, it's a great privilege and a pleasure uh, to uh, look at these things and to uh, edit these sections and be a part of this volume. Thank you very much uh, uh, for such clear presentations. And I think we've covered quite a lot in the last half an hour to, to 40 minutes. So I'll, I'll hand the floor over to, to Sandrine, who is now going to um, um, monitor a series of, of questions. And you know I'm, I'm sure there will be many, uh, many, many things to, to, to the three of you again. Thank you, Anne. And so thank you for those uh, three great presentations. Um, I think we we are uh, many of us are looking forward to 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 your great read. Um, so if there are questions, so you can ask them directly. Uh, in this case, I just ask you to maybe raise your hand, so your your virtual hand, I mean. Um, but otherwise, you can also uh, ask them in write them in the chat, and I'll uh, ask them for you. Um, Right, there's actually, there's a first question in the uh, uh, chat box uh, about the, um, so which asks you to develop on the disagreements between Puritans 
and the notion of wicked. I'm not sure what it refers to. Um, Leonard, could you, did you, would you like to uh, elaborate? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I think in your presentation, um, I saw that you mentioned the term wicked and, and there were also disagreements among Puritans uh, on this notion and uh, I didn't understand. Um, so. Are you sure? Are you sure it was about it, the word was wicked? Um, <laughs> I may be mistaken. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I might have said the godly and the wicked. I think. Uh, um, I think that might. I mean, I think um, as Greg Trest as well, Puritanism focuses. To some extent on the individual and the individual's responsibility and piety but I think and it's connected you know I'm not a theologian so be very crude but in a very crude way to the sense uh, to a Calvinist sense that the world is divided between the reprobate and the damned which of course are not necessarily to be identified in this world with people who are visibly godly or apparently wicked but I think in practice Puritanism is also a sense of community a sense of community of God's saints who you know probably were saved even if you could never know for certain and who had a responsibility um, as a result not to earn salvation but as a result of what God and Christ had done for them to reform the world. And I think they also had a sense, which you do certainly see in politics, um, particularly at the Restoration, where a wide range of Puritans are being, uh, clergy are being removed from their livings and the laity are, you know, having to worship illegally if they want to continue with their ministers. A sense that, that they, they are defending God's cause and then they will um, and that in the end the wicked will God will defeat the wicked and the ungodly so I think I think wicked is a term they use mm -hmm. um, but they and I think they certainly often see the world in in polarized ways yeah just a uh, just a <clears throat> quick follow-up to that I think that's exactly right I think you know you think about the visible ocular catechism of William Perkins's uh, golden chain for example oh, yeah. where you have you could just google um, William Perkins golden chain and see it quite easily but it uh, <clears throat> it basically divides the world into the reprobate and the elect and uh, there's a progression with each of those and um, <clears throat> I think that's uh, an accurate way of describing uh, this predestinarian theology that they held to, um, recognizing, however, that they thought there were ways of testing that as part of the experimental element of Puritanism. Mm -hmm. That is that there are, there are, um, there are fruits uh, that indicate uh, whether or not one is uh, the elect or um, or the reprobate or the wicked, um, and yet in this life uh, you'll you, you'll never know. Um, so they often spoke of the the Jesus's parable of the wheat and the tares um, that there is a field filled with wheat and weeds, and um, <clears throat> that in this life uh, there will be no going out and being able to pull up and tell which is wheat and which is uh which is the tares uh that that will be at the final judgment in their mind can i just say there's a there's some questions in the chat about when we're using the term saints which i think may be confusing people because um they often spoke of them that the the saved as god's elect saints but it's obviously a very different conception of what saints are than within mm. the Catholic or, or certain forms of Lutheran. They did not, in the main, think, you know, that you should have saints who were in the Catholic sense. So I think that may be a form of um, 
you know, linguistic confusion that, that I was taking for granted. But when they talk to themselves as God's elect saints, or perhaps not themselves, but people they knew, they meant it in a very different way um, from, you know, within a Catholic culture. Thank, thank you, thank you. Um, so th there's also a, a question which is linked to what you said about the uh, diversity of Puritanism, um, about separatists. Would you consider separatists as Puritans? Do you include, especially, I guess, in the uh, Oxford Handbook, do you include them in, uh, uh, in Puritanism, generally speaking, or, or do you consider that they are just outside? So I guess uh, there, there's no uh, detail here, but I guess by uh, separatists, we refer to, I don't know, brownists or those yeah. kind of uh, groups, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, it, let me uh, perhaps address that. And, and I think this is something where there is a lot of diversity um, within the scholarly community on this. Uh, and I probably 15, 20 years ago was more likely to make a sharper distinction between separatists and those who were not. Uh, increasingly, as I've been focusing on the group that went from Scrooby to Amsterdam to Leiden to Plymouth and New England, uh, led by William Brewster, John Robinson, William Bradford, I, I tend to see the distinctions as not being fundamental. Um, and one of the things that I'm working on editing right now for a collection is a series of dialogues that William Bradford wrote in manuscript, uh, in one in 1648 and another in 1652, uh, one in between that apparently has been lost. In, in which he tried to explain the separatist heritage. And he's very clearly identifies the congregationalism practiced by his group with New England congregationalism as espoused by people like John Cotton, John Davenport, and with the writings of the dissenting brethren in England whom Greg alluded to. Um, theologically, you're not going to find a whole lot of difference between some English separatist and the mainstream Puritan movement, if you will. Uh, in terms of ecclesiology, they're congregationalist, um, as are the dissenting brethren, uh, the group that becomes known as independence in England. Um, now, defining all of this, putting boundaries, I think becomes very, very difficult. And uh, I would also just qualify that separatists are not uniform. And so when you talk about separatism, some of the people who are considered separatists uh, who go to the Netherlands move off in a direction uh, becoming Anabaptist, uh, which, you know, the, the Scrooby, Wyden, New England group uh, would disapprove of. Uh, but then again, within mainstream Puritanism, if you will, uh, you might find someone like a Roger Williams, who for a time espouses Baptist views. Uh, and then just to try and complicate things more, um, I think we have to think more about where along the spectrum of Puritanism, how we define Puritanism, and what that means for how we identify Quakers. Because most of those who become Quakers clearly do come out of the Puritan movement. Uh, there's, there's a sense in which a distinguishing factor is that while most Puritans believe that they can discern God's will from an inspired reading of the scriptures, Quakers will go a step further and say, you don't really need the scripture. God can speak directly to you in the form of an inner light. Now, is that a distinct enough difference to thrust them outside the Puritan category or not? Uh, I think that's something that people would 
have legitimate discussion about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in relation to, to all this, and again, the diversity of Puritanism, uh, our, our colleague, John Eric, uh, asks um, if you can say more about antinomianism in relation, I guess, to mainstream Puritanism and separatism and, and so on. Let me, let me jump in. I, I'm sure that Anne and Greg will have something, but when uh, that was being discussed by my colleagues, I reached on a shelf and pulled out something uh, that I thought was relevant. And in the latter 17th century, there was uh, an English Puritan by the name of Stephen Lobb, who had connections with New Englanders. And at one point he said in a treatise, it cannot be denied, but many in their opposition to antinomianism have fallen in with Arminianism, et cetera and that divers in running from Arminianism, et cetera, have plunged themselves into the antinomian gulf. And I've always been struck by the fact that, that there is a certain dynamic within Puritanism in which antinomianism and Arminianism are opposite poles in answer to how does one get saved. And a lot of what we see in the 17th century are people trying to react to the one element, the one pole, by moving a little bit to the other pole and so forth. Uh, I don't know how my colleagues might think about that, but I, I've always found that a, a useful way of trying to recognize the tension that's in the movement when it comes to the question of how can I know that I've been saved? I, th I think um, it's very interesting that because it's all, oh, my mom. I'm not. Um, I think it's also the key to one of the great controversies of the 1650s between John Owen and Richard Baxter. Mm -hmm. I mean, Baxter is accused of Arminianism, of, of you know, qualifying Calvinism um, by a focus on, on works that you can earn salvation. And as Greg said, you know, within the Perkins thing and the, the man I'm dealing with, the Puritan merchant who writes down all this a load of sermons which are in this tradition of sanctification is inextricably um, tight tangled up or connected to justification so your salvation if, if God has chosen you then you, the fruits of, I think that's the term that um, that Greg used you, you will you will lead a godly life you cannot to to think that earns you salvation is a denial of god's power and a presumption but you should you sh there should be some fruits of it but that can lead and that's what you know was said in in um in um new england as well as old england it can look as if you think you can earn salvation and yet owen was more worried about arminianism and than he was about ant antinomianism is that you know that god's grace I mean, you know, the theologians, you know, God's grace acts immediately. And Como sees it very much um, as, a re as a reaction to despair. I mean, it may be, you know, in Greg's, Greg's account of the religious and the non-religious, and, and um, I'm the one in this team that's not religious myself, um, that um, Calvinism is quite difficult to preach and live through. Well, very, you know, but that a minority are predestined to salvation. And that, you know, you can't, it's very hard to know if you're one of the lucky ones. And Como sees antinomianism as a sort of response almost to what, what I think he exaggerates, because I've been working on people who are more mainstream Perkins, Ohonian Calvinists, but you know that this is a breakthrough where you have an immediate um, grace has acted on you immediately and would and it solve things. Um, so I think it it's hard to be, and it's also connected, you know, from the either 1640s with you know ranters as radical Arminians, uh, radical antinomians who think. You know, mm -hmm. if you're God's elect, you can do what you like, sort of thing, which which is one of the criticisms of Calvinism. So 
so I think yes I think there's these there are these difficulties in preaching Calvinism in a national church and or even in you know a sort of self-selected more godly context of New England of how you how you negotiate so so psychologically as well as pastorally and theologically Could I just the, take, yeah. yeah just take 90 seconds and just um, add to that I think it's important to remember that you know with 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 antinomianism what you have there is um I would say a reaction against both something that is uh, pretty mainstream within Puritanism and then something that is um, more of a, well, more of a radical form of Puritanism. Uh, on the one hand, you have Puritanism in the main stressing the importance of practical divinity and that if you are truly a, if you are truly born again, if you are truly a uh, believer who has received grace, then the inevitable result will be a certain, a certain lifestyle and the importance of those fruits. And then you have what I think Theodore Bozeman has rightly called the precisionist strain, where within Puritanism, you have a kind of hyper form of practical divinity. And the antinomianism in different strains reacts against both of those things. That it reacts against the strain which is seen by those antinomian proponents as being, for all of its talk on grace, uh, a kind of legalism that, it, that you're not saved by grace, but you're actually saved through your behavior in, um, in, in, a, in living out a Puritan lifestyle. And yet at the same time, um, Puritans in the main critiquing antinomians of the importance of fruit. So I think it's, I think, I think there's a tension there. I think too, um, coming back to the question about separatism and radicalism, it's important to remember that uh, separate that that the more radical Puritans. Uh, believed that when you think about this distinction between the visible and the invisible church, the visible church is the those who uh, are members of the church. The invisible church are the are the elect. Um, uh, radical or more sectarian Puritans had had a certain confidence about mapping out the visible church or the invisible church onto the visible church, and and in that way. They separated, um, believing that um, certain members of the visible church really were not members of the invisible church, and therefore it was incumbent upon them uh, to separate. And so I think these these kind of big categories of visible church, invisible church, root, uh, you, you could say mm -hmm. the root of faith and the fruits of faith and uh, they map out onto these debates in ways that I think are helpful to kind of categorize people. Um, I'd like to just add one quick thing that's relevant to this. Um, for, for those of you who are interested in this particular aspect, I, I'd recommend that you look at uh, the article that I think was intended partially for this study group uh, by Alexandra Walsham in uh, the French Journal of British Studies Review Francais de Civilisation Britannique uh, last year on the godly and their neighbors. Mm -hmm. and, and Alex makes some very good points about the, the con contradictory impulses of inclusion and exclusion within Puritanism. And uh, I think it's, it's a valuable article. I, I think those of you interested in this would really like, uh, would really benefit from looking at it. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. So there's um, a question on um, the um, more social dimension of Puritanism, although it's linked to uh, uh, what uh, has just been said as well. Um, so there's a question on um, whether Puritanism encouraged social exclusion or social uh, bonds on the contrary. So um, what can you say about this? I think both. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's that's one of the points of Alex's article that I, I was just referring to. Um, and, and one of the things that one of the things that you get into when you talk about exclusion, not having anything to do with the the ungodly. Is that you have to recognize that for Puritans who fundamentally believed that one soul was that, that election was made manifest in one's soul by God's grace, that that conversion, if we want to use that term, could happen as late as a person's deathbed. And so while you might have suspicions about your neighbor and their activities, you couldn't be sure that they weren't among the elect. And, and so that works against completely shunning them. I, th I think it's also, if, if one was thinking sociologically, um, and again, to lower the tone a bit, it's, it's not clear whether separatists who didn't have anything suppose you're someone who likes to go to the alehouse or you know isn't a brilliant um at you know listening to the sermon a separatist who didn't bother you with at all with you at all perhaps cost ca caused you less trouble than a than a sort of godly activist who wanted to reform you so i think in terms of the question in the chat about tolerance as a virtue um, you could ignore, you might think separatists were dangerous, third, but you could, you could ignore them if they were ignoring you, whereas the sort of um, activist Christians that Peter, quote I had from Peter Lake and that Greg talked about, they're the ones who often cause trouble in their communities because they're, they're trying to impose higher standards on their neighbours. Um, but it is you know, it's it's again one of these things that's very contextualized and very, you know, very variable. And I think that the question asked about tolerance, which I think is an interesting way how, about how you get on with people, um, the question of toleration of differing views, I think, is another rather different one. And I don't know how much that comes into your, you know, there's certainly nothing intrinsically tolerationist about any of these ideas, though they may, in different contexts, become, you know, arguments for religious toleration. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe linked to, to this uh, more uh, social dimension to a certain extent, uh, there's a question about uh, chapter 18 in the, uh, in the uh, handbook. Okay. which is entitled Puritans in the Marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you were asked if you could say a bit more about this uh, chapter, what it um, develops, the, um, what it is about, generally speaking. So it might be in relation with, um, you know, Puritans in society, generally speaking. Yeah, so it's is Frank going to say something? <laughs> we do have that chapter, so we could say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I. It, it's uh, Mark Valeri has has written that chapter, and and in terms of New England, which is what he's most familiar with, uh, he has a book called Godly Merchandise, which offers a, a fair amount of insight into this. Um, I'm not sure how I would would sort of summarize some of that, uh, and I apologize for that because I probably should be able to. Um, it certainly it, it's easier to see sort of um, the imposition of a social ethic on the marketplace in New England because Puritans for most of the 17th century are are in, are in control here. Um, they do believe in a just price, but they're willing to acknowledge that there are marketplace conditions which will allow certain individuals to charge more than might have been customary. 
Um, so they're, they're, they're aware, for instance, of uh, the fact that nails might have cost one thing in England, but if you're buying them in New England, there is a transportation cost that's involved in, and, and, and so forth. Um, they believe in using profit for godly methods. And so you, you, you get a certain amount of uh, charitable purchase of catechisms, uh, religious treatises, uh, sermons and so forth, which are distributed. Um, what, what, what Mark argues as well is, is that, you know, as, as time goes on, you have a sort of progression where Puritan values, social values, communal values, the importance of the community over individual enrichment start out imposing themselves on the marketplace in New England. As time goes on, you find the forces of the marketplace begin to shape more what the clergy are talking about. Um, I'm not sure that's, that's a great answer for the question that was asked, but uh, it's probably the best I can do right now off the top of my head. It, 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 all, it, it also touches on, I mean, not perhaps directly, but the whole tradition of, which goes back in different, different ways to Weber of whether um, the sort of thing we've been talking about, about leading a godly yeah. life, an ascetic, mm. disciplined life, and whether that is connected to, you know, even if not directly favouring individual mm. um, enrichment, whether it actually made you more effective in a capitalist world, to which, I mean, the odds, you know, it's a very complex and debated issue. Um, but it's something that's very much um, in, in the literature about, mm -hmm. um, you know, religion and the rise of capitalism is the famous book by R.H. Tawney. Um, but, but, you know, as Frank says, it's a lot about, you know, you should not value worldly success. You know, your worldly success is sort of your good luck from God and it should be. So it's a complicated issue, um, but it's something I think that in a... Uh, in, in a handbook to, to Puritanism, it's obviously in the very long-standing historiography that certain forms of activist Calvinist divinity had sometimes unintended consequences, but had consequences. Mm. I think it also, um, I was gonna say that if we think about Puritanism as diverse and as also being relational, relational some of these Puritans and, you know, Puritans and music or Puritans and um, the market, you do wonder sometimes whether you're talking, mm -hmm. you know, whether there is anything specific about Puritanism, which you couldn't say was about really, well, Protestant or even about Christianity, you know, it's sort of, um, it, it makes, the, the modern historiography makes some, topics in the handbook very very rich and very effective um, but I think it makes others um, you know more difficult because if Puritanism is a sort of amalgam of you know bits and pieces or if it's very diverse then some of the questions are you know harder to answer. That, those mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last question um, for, for Greg, but I, I'm, I'm sure Frank and Anne can also uh, add a, a few things on this. Um, Catherine would like to know, Greg, if you, um, when you mentioned the Westminster Assembly, uh, whether you said that one of the things that were uh, debated in the Westminster Assembly uh, was the creed um did you say that they rejected it and uh if yes on what grounds yeah yeah so <clears throat> i think it'd be helpful to kind of just contextualize that comment with with um the westminster assembly takes place in 1643 which follows a decade of uh laudian reform in in the church of england so william laud famously becomes archbishop of canterbury 
1633, and there is a rejection of um, of Cal not just Calvinism, but some of the pure some of the, many of the things that we are we we've been talking about. And so when you think about you know Puritanism as one half of a stressful relationship, you could say that that relationship was most acutely stressful in the relationship between w William Laud and and the Puritans. And that that Laud and uh, those who would who would have yoked themselves with the ideology that was was put forward by the regime uh, that that was called Laudianism, and it was um, in addition to being anti-Puritan, anti-Puritan, it also uh, placed a premium on uh, tradition and particularly patristic tradition. Um, so think about Jean-Louis Quentin's book, um, The Church of England and Christian Antiquity. He talks about um, different strands within the Church of England and their relationship to, um, to the early church. Uh, the Puritans uh, were, were those who read, certainly read, read widely and even read uh, the church fathers, uh, most most particularly Augustine, and yet, first and foremost, they saw them as a people of one book, uh, the people of the scriptures, and therefore, when they crafted the confession and larger and shorter catechism, and their real a project at the assembly was to be, first and foremost, scriptural, and so there was a debate about the extent to which they would take on creedal language whole cloth, meaning, you know, the, the famous statements in the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed around Christology or Trinitarianism, or the extent to which they would, would, would try to adopt uh, verbatim biblical language. And so the argument that Chad Van Dixhorn, I think, has made convincingly is that there was a resistance to accept creedal language and to use creedal formulations, even if the formulations they used were basically saying the same thing. There was a resistance to use those exact formulas for fear that they might be seen as relying on and building their catechisms and confessions on creedal traditional patristic formulas um and so that's the the argument that there's an anti-creedalism at the assembly which nevertheless the the formulas that they put forward uh, you still get to the same place just with different words uh, and this is interesting because uh john calvin was very uh very happy uh, to to employ you know creedal language in his famous institutes and other places, and so you have people citing authorities like John Calvin, um, saying what's wrong with what, what's wrong with using using this language if it's good enough for Calvin it it must be good enough for us. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have, so I'm, I'm sorry if there were questions that we didn't have time to ask, um, but well, thank you very much for your answers. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, just, just to conclude once again, um, uh, thank you so much for the three of us for having been here, uh, and to Solheim obviously as well. <laughs> And uh, and to um, all of you who who attended, both both colleagues and and, and students. So that um, completes this particular cycle of zooms that we wanted to do this year on collective volumes. And um, if you remember, we we started with uh, uh, Frank's encyclopedia, then we moved to uh, the uh, Cambridge Companion to Puritanism, and now. Um, uh, to the Oxford Handbook because it was important for us to have this general views and presentations of what Puritanism could be coming from many different perspectives as opposed to uh, a monograph and more specific studies which will 
come next year because we're doing that for two years, not only this year, but we'll have another round <laughs> next year. Um, so we'll, we'll obviously invite other speakers. But thank you so much for being here for you know for your 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 very generous work uh, in in preparing that and and just tailoring it so nicely to the students needs so you know once again thank you very much and have a lovely weekend and, and thank you yeah thank you thank you so much thank bye you bye bye, bye. thanks bye